The third characteristic of our new world is excessive violence. I have mentioned to you that in the last century there were three times as many violent deaths as in the previous 19 centuries put together. Do you know how many people are murdered in your world and mine? 450,000 a year. It's exceeded by suicide. Do you know how many suicides there are in a year? About a million. 10 million try. 1 million succeed. Men are more successful than women. This is a very dangerous world. Men like Karl Marx with their wrong information produce violence in the world. The last world war killed 72 million people, 30 million Russians, 16 million Germans. What a world. WHO, the World Health Organization, has said it's become a very dangerous world for half the population. Who? Women. Women are an endangered species because of the cruelty and the selfishness of most men. And the World Health Organization has issued a warning. This must change or the world is in tremendous trouble. Remember, I mentioned beforehand that we are mortal and we are ignorant and we are sinful. You've heard of Jeffrey Dahmer, killed about 18 men and ate them. It was because of his belief in atheism and evolution. We live in a world of social engineering. It's changed half the world. China's population is the biggest population on earth. Russia began it with social engineering from what they'd picked up from the memory of Karl Marx. Writers are dangerous because they convey information that can be right or wrong. You've heard of Ernest Hemingway. Perhaps you don't know that Ernest had probably more accidents than many men on earth because he was a drunk. He loved violence, big game hunting, big game fishing. But Hemingway was not a good man. He hated his mother. Don Passos, who knew him, said, I've never met a man, a man who hated his own mother. But Ernest Hemingway hated his own mother until her death in her 80s. His parents were great Christians, strong Christians. Grace was said at every meal. Every morning there was family worship, Bible reading, hymn singing, prayer. When his mother asked him after he left home, how was his Christian experience, Ernest lied. He was a famous liar. He lied without even thinking about it. He said to his mother, Mother, don't think about it a bit. I say my prayers every night and I'm a better Christian than I ever was. That's not true. He was a violent man. He clashed with just about every writer he ever met. He wrote one book where he put a whole string of lies about Scott Fitzgerald and Scott's wife, Zelda. She'd punctured his ego and he had a terrible ego. I mentioned he'd had about a hundred accidents, including two plane accidents. By the time he reached his 60, he was a very depressed man, bad tempered, irritable, depressed. He tried several times to take, take his own life and at 62 he succeeded, blew out his brains with a double barrel shotgun. You know, this century has seen a flight of reason. Intellectuals have become interested more in things that are sensual, more in things that are hedonistic. If I were to name some of the most famous intellectuals 
of the 20th century, you would find it is even so, so tragic. Viktor Frankl, who went to two concentration camps, second being Auschwitz, he said these concentration camps are not the result of an office at Berlin. These concentration camps are the result of teachers, professors at colleges and universities who teach nihilism. You know what nihilism? Nihilism says you can't know anything for sure. Nothing really matters. There's another trigger besides wrong philosophy to violence. There's alcohol. Why do people put something in their stomach that robs their brain, their head of brains? Why lose your head for the sake of your stomach? There's a whole string of famous Hollywood people who died in their 50s because of alcohol. It began with John Barrymore. One of the more recent was Richard Burton, the chief love of Elizabeth Taylor, for whom he surrendered a beautiful wife that he'd married years earlier. Alcohol is the trigger for a great deal of violence. Now let me make a suggestion to you. But first I must tell you one or two things more about our world. If our world was smaller, it couldn't hold an atmosphere, so no people could live in it. If it was much bigger, it would have too much hydrogen in the atmosphere, and again no people could live in it. If our world was close to the sun, there'd be no liquid water. People couldn't live. If we were too far away from the sun, we would freeze. I wonder if you've heard of the anthropic coincidences. In the 1970s, a very great scientist, Brandon Carter, suggested all the laws of physics had been engineered to produce us, human beings. There's a lot of evidence for that. Francis Collins, who headed the genome project, caring for 200 scientists, he had this to say. He said that there are 15 fundamental elements of the universe. 15. Each of them is controlled by a precise mathematical number. And if any one of them differed, by one in a million, there'd be no life. In some cases, if they differed by one in a million, million, there'd be no life. Now he was a Christian, so let me give you an atheist. Stephen Hawking said the odds of a universe like ours being the result of the Big Bang are overwhelmingly against it. He says, I know this has religious implications, but to believe the universe is just the result of the Big Bang is very hard to tolerate. Now it's true there have been great scientists like Stephen, Gay, Stephen Jay Gould who said human beings as a result of 50 billion coincidences. Well, some people would rather believe that Jonas followed the whale than that we're the result of 50 billion coincidences. He, Gould said we were just a freak arrival. Simpson, another great scientist, said we're the product of a process that had no intention of producing us. This is plainly wrong. When Carl Sagan took the program Cosmos, he says the cosmos is all there is, all there was, all there ever could be. But when he wrote on life from Psychopreed Britannica, look it up, life. He said the smallest instance of life, smaller than a speck of dust, requires more information for its coming to life than a hundred million pages of Britannica could offer. You've heard of Paul Davies, another famous scientist, 
great man, but not a professed Christian. He said every cell, now remember, every cell is smaller than a speck of dust. And every cell has in it one to two metres of DNA. DNA gave a horrible shock to evolutionists. It showed that we have fundamental cells in the body that contain the equivalent of a hundred million pages of Britannica. We found that DNA was a hundred times more concise than anything we could make. Paul Davies said every cell has pumps, levers, turbines, motors and scissors. He's talking about in miniature of course, minuscule, but every cell smaller than a speck of dust has a whole host of marvellous things that enable us to function. The human cell has as many parts as a jumbo jet, about 6,000. Why do I tell you this? Because there's no chance that the universe is the result of chance. You can either believe that an eternal nothing made matter and mind, or you can believe eternal matter made mind and matter, or you can believe an eternal mind made matter and mind. Only one of them has any sense. The evolutionists used to say it's ridiculous to say that something was made by nothing, meaning God didn't make anything. So they prefer to believe that everything came from nothing. Well, believe it if you must, but there's no sense in it. Do you understand if your brain and mind was a result of irrational causes, we would have no reason to trust it. Darwin was puzzled by this. He was the first social Darwinist. He said the time will come when the white races will have to destroy the savage black races. That was the beginning of social engineering in ideals. But Darwin was troubled by the mind. He said, if my mind is a result of a process similar to what produced the rat, why should I trust it? He never answered it. You can't answer it. The brain has 125 trillion switches, synapses. That's more than all the switches of all the computers, all the internets in the world. 125 trillion switches in the cortex of your cerebrum. Unless God made the brain, we have no reason to trust any of its conclusions. It is the most ingenious invention in the whole universe. Could not be the result of chance. So what? Well, here's my sim simple suggestion. Give God his place. Give God his place. The universe is here because of God. It's sustained because of God. You and I are here because of God. Give God his place. He loves us. The good book says he's kind to the unthankful and to the evil. He makes his sun to rise on the good and the evil sends rain on the just and the unjust. He died for our sins. Sin demands punishment. He took it. Do you understand the word justification? It does not mean being made righteous unless you're talking about status. Justification means just as if I'd never sinned because of the atoning death of the Son of God on Calvary. If we accept the gift, we are counted as though we had never sinned. We're still sinners. We still make mistakes. We still blunder unceasingly. But looking to Christ, accepting the love of God, we're complete in Him. We're accepted in the Beloved. We're counted as though we're really and truly 
100% righteous. Now let me tell you something. Jesus went to stay once in the home of Mary and Martha, two sisters who loved him. And Mary just sat down and listened to him, sensible girl. But Martha was preparing a meal for 13 men, 12 disciples and Jesus. She got a bit tired of it, came to Jesus and she said, Mary's letting me do all the work. Why don't you tell her to help me? Listen closely. This can simplify your life. This can change your life. This can take away your fears, your troubles, your anxieties. It can make your life full of good fruit. Listen carefully. What did Jesus say to Martha? Martha, Martha, you're anxious and careful and worried about many things. Only one thing is needful. Mary has chosen that good part that can never be taken from her. What's he saying? He's saying we should give God his place. With our energies, our material possessions, our wealth, our heart, our actions, our thoughts, give God his place. He loves sinful people. With him is the secret of life. If you have God, you have everything. Doesn't matter what happens, all things work together for those that love God. I wonder if you understand the ground that we've travelled. We've talked about a world that's become a global village where you have to be very smart, have all the right information to survive, and you have to be very careful to avoid violence. And there's no way of avoiding chance unless you belong to your Creator. Do you understand me, my friends? Christian Gospel is not good advice. It's good news that God is for you, though you have often been against Him, that He's willing to accept you. He says, come unto me, all you are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take his commandments seriously. Worship is the main duty of life. You understand the Ten Commandments begin with four commandments about worship. Absolutely ignored. That's why the world's in trouble. A world without God can only have misery and mockery. Ten Commandments are a guide for living. And the first four are about worship. The fourth one, altogether neglected, is the only one that begins with remember. It's the biggest of the Ten Commandments, has more specifications, it's more protected and hemmed in by the other commandments, so it can't be missed in importance, it can't be glossed over, but humans do gloss over. We forget that the, the rest day was a symbol of the Gospel. That one day in the week when we can take time off to worship our Creator in a special way, was a symbol of the fact he wants to give us rest of heart, peace of mind, and a wonderful, fruitful life. I invite you, dear friend, to consider this simplification of life. It is the only thing that will work, and it can work for you. God bless you.